Um, this is an AMA, so yeah, we want you to ask questions of Juan here. Um, but let's start with, I want to talk about the Filecoin improvement protocol uh, proposal. Um, because I know you said it's kind of contentious. Yeah. So first of all, like for us that do not know, because I do not know, like tell us what it's about and then why it's contentious yeah. and what is it voting yay, nay? Yeah, totally. So um, there's a pretty important um, Falcon improvement proposal right now in the ecosystem. This is like a really awesome um, example of the community getting very involved in the governance of the protocol. Uh, and so the proposal is about voting on um, a set of protocol changes that are going to change, um, that are going to add a duration multiplier to storage deals so that um, storage providers could commit for longer periods of time uh, and they're more incented to do so. Uh, and it's also going to change some of the economic parameters. So it, this means it's going to just tune the, the economy, which will cause significant changes to, to all of the storage provider businesses. So naturally, that comes with significant um, uh, decision-making uh, uh, importance because that will change the, the, the bottom lines of many companies out there. And the kind of background behind uh, the thinking of this proposal is that uh, we wanted to, there's lots of different economic parameters across the Falcon network, um, but in particular there's some that we've learned a lot about um, sort of like what the parameters should be in the long term. And we also wanted to um, improve the, the duration of deals for a lot of clients because they want longer, longer storage. But the real, like, deeper, more important reason to do it right now is that these kinds of economic parameters, which could be changed in the future, um, probably should be changed now because of the macro environment. So the macro environment back backdrop creates a lot of pressure um, in this, this period. Um, so that kind of change, um, if it, there's a lot of contention about whether it should happen now or in the future or time. Um, and there's a lot of difficulties in terms of implementing this. So getting it into the protocol has like a very short term window, so like that just has become um, very, uh, you know, very tough. How many people are voting on this right now? Do you um, know? Probably, um, I think a few hundred or maybe, I, I'm not sure what the, I haven't looked at the, uh, the poll in the last um, uh, day or two, but there's uh, lots of different people, uh, and they also represent uh, many organizations and companies, and so there's like, for example, storage providers voting with their power, which by the way is like a sure. super interesting governance thing to do, like voting with, the, with your actual like hard drives uh, with the data in them and so on. Um, and, and so, yeah, there's lots of different companies and groups and organizations uh, involved, and so this will be a super interesting test of the uh, governance of the community. Like this is, like, this is your network, this is like, we're building this together, and so, like, what the community votes and decides is, like, what will happen. So, you know, get, get out there and, and, and vote on this. Nice. Is it, this is surely not the first. Vote. No, there's been many FIPS okay. before. Um, we don't use voting for all of them because most of them are, like, important, just simple protocol improvements that won't come with, with um, significant effects. For any kind of, like, harder, more contentious thing where there's many participants with, like, nuances and, and, and so on, that's when we tend to lean towards polls. Gotcha. Okay. Um, are there questions out in the audience? Um, I liked when the lights were up. Sorry to talk to the AV <laughs> from, from the stage, but then I could see. If anybody has questions, um, there are mics in both of the rows. Um, and so come on up and ask a question. I feel like I see somebody walking. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Hi. Can, can you hear me all right? Sure can. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Hi. My name is Eddie. I actually work for Protocol Labs. Uh, I'm new to the Web3 space, so apologies for any of the uh, 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 kind of noob questions here. But uh, going back to the FIP and FIP36 specifically, there's been some concerns about uh, liquidity and the ability to use fill. Uh, my understanding is that the FIP will lock up considerably more fill over time. Um, and the sentiment is that there is a lot of fill that is already locked up and there's not great access to it. Um, could you? Talk about a little bit about your thinking and rationale behind uh, what, what's going on there in the network. Yeah, uh, it's a great question. So a lot of the Falcon economic parameters were set in either you know, 2019, 2020, um, when a lot of, um, and kind of out of like research done in like the years prior. Uh, I think since then, by both running Filecoin and seeing a lot of um, uh, other protocols out there, uh, the whole Web3 community has learned a lot about um, economic structures. Um, and so it, 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 there's an important parameter that's like a lock parameter within, within the design of the network. Um, and that, I think, should be tuned uh, much higher. 
So I'm, I'm probably an outlier here. I think that, sh that should be tuned much higher than the current FIP proposes. Uh, but that's maybe more important in the very long term of the network. It may not be as important shorter term. Um, and then in terms of, there, there's also a lot of liquid Filecoin. So it's not, um, I think what's happening is that um, uh, token holders aren't uh, lending it out. And so either the, there's missing uh, loan programs that need to target those, those, uh, those lenders, uh, or there's missing primitives in, um, uh, in, in the network where, like, you know, it's kind of difficult right now to onboard into, into one of these loan, loan programs. So you can just look at the, at the circulating supply. There's a ton of Filecoin that could be, could be provided to the storage providers so they can do their work and, and store, uh, store the data. And um, just, just to follow up on that a little bit, uh, are you hoping or seeing that the FIP may incentivize uh, the holders of that fill to then lend um, because there's going to be a greater need? Uh, yeah, so I think, I mean, I think in general, um, any, any, kind of, uh, any kind of adjustments to um, the use of Filecoin, so any kind of things that will cause either um, Filecoin to be spent or used or, or, um, or traded or transacted will tend to um, uh, increase demand for the token, and then that will um, increase uh, 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 just the, the willingness of those, of those token holders to, to lend it out. Um, so yeah, I think like, that's, that's a, a part of it. Um, but I think there's a, it's pretty orthogonal. The returns are like, through the loan programs today are significant. Um, and so that's not the hurdle. The hurdle is that the programs are probably not able to support a lot of the, a lot of the token holders. Gotcha. Yeah, but uh, by the way, I would love to kind of like limit the FIP discussion to like a fraction of the, of the time so we can talk about other, other exciting things. Thank you very much. Yeah, it is kind of interesting that, you know, we're, you're talking about a protocol that was created in 2019, right? Launched in 2020, and, you know, it feels like a long time ago, but also it's just two years ago. And so to upgrade the network that fast, I think, you know, is a, that's a really good thing, right? I, I guess there is this notion in crypto, though, to sort of hold on to the uh, original architecture, right? You see this in Bitcoin most dramatically, probably. But I guess maybe talk about that. Like, how is the community taking some of these changes when they're made and this change? Um, you know, is it more like Bitcoin and that they want that original structure or more? Uh, yeah, that's a, a great question. Um, so... So, so there's like, yeah, the, the long discussion in, in Web3 and crypto as to whether or not um, you should set the parameters once and like just walk away. Um, when you think about something as simple as Bitcoin, where it's just about doing transactions and, and payments and so on, then maybe you get to do that. Uh, if you're building something like, a, like Ethereum, where you now have smart contracts and you have gas to worry about and you have sharding and scaling and so on involved, then you're going to end up making a lot more changes. Um, but even that could potentially stabilize. Uh, Vitalik gave a talk recently about this where he thinks that uh, the protocol will stabilize sometime in the, in the next few years as they, they settle the, uh, the scalability questions. Now, for Filecoin, it's a super interesting question because um, Filecoin needs to compete with cloud storage providers in a centralized environment. So Filecoin needs to find a way to update itself and different parts of it, like different programs, um, in order to compete with a changing dynamic environment where you're competing with super smart, super intelligent people running massive scale corporations, right? So you're, we're talking about like Filecoin competing with like Amazon and Google right. and, and Microsoft. And so if you set the parameters once and walk away, you're never gonna succeed because even if you set them right, you're gonna eventually get to a point where they're gonna adapt, change, and, and beat Filecoin. So the Filecoin network will have to continue evolving but the important part is maybe compartmentalizing what evolves. Maybe we can get to uh, solidifying a bunch of the components and the parameters, and then those can stick uh, for the long term. But I do think the future is going to have a lot of challenges that we, don't, we cannot foresee, and the network will have to adapt and evolve and improve in order to stay really relevant. I, I honestly think that Bitcoin is going to eventually succumb because of this, uh, because it's so anti-change, um, it'll get replaced. I hate to hear you say that, but also... <laughs> <laughs> it might fine. take a long time, right? Like, it uh, surely will take a long time, yeah. yeah. Or maybe, like, you know, they will start becoming more uh, susceptible to change or, or more excited about it in, in the future, you know. It will change hands at some point. Um, I do think there's another question, so go ahead over here. Hello, hello, Juan. Thank you, uh, Red One. I work at ChainSafe. I'm not going to ask a technical question, but more since you're here, I would like to have a little bit of more of your vision in 10, 20 years what we're going to be able to have with Filecoin. Because if I, if I look, you know, incentivize layer on storage, when we're going to be able to imagine, and especially also like with um, content addressing, like 
Let's dream, for instance, like you have one MP3 made by one person. It's going to be stored on IPFS or and with Ficon on top. And can we imagine in the future having real decentralized like utopia where all the creators, it can be you know movies, it can be it can be like arts that are going to be able to store but be retributed directly on on that network. And could you maybe tell us more about like those vision like in 10, 20 years to see like what exactly is going to be completely transformative Dave, yeah. in, uh, with, with Ficon? Yeah. So look. Um, in the long term, we need to build a digital infrastructure that puts users first and puts rights uh, and bakes them into the, into the network. Um, so what I mean by that is that today, um, most of your digital life, and that is more and more just most of your life, uh, is running through applications and protocols and systems interacting through these computers. And today, all of that is governed by a lot of corporations around the world and a lot of different nations. And even though you're interacting with lots of people in the world across nations and so on, uh, at any point, things can change from under you uh, overnight. Like right now in Iran, there's people who have been blocked from using their messenger applications and cannot interact with each other because the government is worried about um, uh, change. And so that, that can happen that fast. Your entire life could be upended that quickly. And it's not just from governments. Corporations can do that too. Corporations shut down services all the time. So today, we, even though we depend so much on this digital infrastructure, we still treat it like um, we, shouldn't, we, we don't have the notion of rights there baked in yet. And we need to do that. So think of it like access to water or access to electricity. We need to build public utilities, global, international public utilities that just work everywhere and that put rights in the user's hands. And, and that's what Falcon is about. So once we, once we can do that, then you can transition all of the digital infrastructure, all of the different kinds of applications out there that you use day to day into networks like this. But there's a lot of work to do to get there. All of the computation stuff that I was talking about today, like we need, we need to build a computing platform that can support that kind of, um, you know, the, all the Web2 things. Like today you can, cannot build um, things like TikTok and Twitter and um, Dropbox and so on. Maybe Dropbox is now closer, but you know, certainly Twitter is really hard uh, on Web3. And so we need to, get the platform to get the range of platforms to be that good to be able to now transition all of that all of our digital life into a network um, that respects our rights oh I like that. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. I mean, it's very in line with the eth broader ethos of crypto, right? Why I got involved in Bitcoin, like, way back in the day as well. I, I guess, like, to transition before your question over here is, like, how did you get involved in crypto to start? Um, yeah, actually, through Bitcoin, too, I was super excited. I still think Bitcoin is... A like super amazing. Um, the, so I got in, involved into crypto for two reasons. One, um, I'd been following cryptocurrencies for a while, so Bitcoin was not the first one. There's been many other cryptocurrencies before. Um, and I actually saw Bitcoin in like 2009 and so on, and I didn't really think it was potentially going to succeed uh, because I had seen many others that looked kind of similar. Um, and I'd been studying it because of, uh, I was doing distributed systems research and networking research in university. And, uh, and so I kind of like, um, that, that's how I sort of got into cryptography and got into cryptocurrencies. And, and you could totally tell at the time the ideas of running um, the world's um, economies using computers, using cryptography, um, was talked about for decades. And it was talked about in the same terms as we talk about email and the web and like web pages and web apps and so on. So it was just natural that this kind of change was eventually going to come. It was just hard to get to that change. And the amazing thing that Bitcoin did was actually break through that barrier. Now, the second thread was that I was really, um, I was working on a lot of like knowledge management tooling. So this is kind of like education um, oriented stuff, like trying to map the dependencies of knowledge and try to like learn faster or like um, help people, help more people learn about various fields. And through that, like, I, I encountered this like, problem in science where um, scientists spend an enormous amount of time just moving around data sets, uh, especially like, large-scale machine learning data sets. And that's when I was like, OK, look, we have version control. We have BitTorrent. Like, you, you could have version control on BitTorrent and use that to move around these large-scale data sets. And that was the beginning of IPFS. So once I started making IPFS, um, then I was like, OK. It would, and, and once I saw that Bitcoin was actually succeeding and breaking through, 
I was like, oh, maybe you could use Bitcoin to pay for IPFS. Or actually, you could maybe get rid of this proof of work thing and use proof of storage instead. And so let's, let's create a network for that. And so like, that's the, the, the inception of, of both. That's actually really interesting. Yeah. OK. Um, we're going to go over here to this question. Hey, uh, my name is Jason. I'm the founder of uh, Identity Startup. Um, I, I can't hear you. Oh, yeah. My name is Jason. I'm the founder of an, uh, Identity Startup. So my question for you is around ZK Proofs. I've heard that uh, Filecoin uses ZK Proofs for uh, some use cases. I'm curious if you could talk a bit about what that looks like today and how you might want to use it more in the future, if at all. Yeah. So we use... Uh, Actually, I think Filecoin is still the largest snark machine on the planet. Like, we, we pump out tons of snarks, like, way more than Zcash and others. Um, and we use them to do the proofs of replication. So um, we need to um, store uh, some data, and we need to encode it through this, like, very expensive process called sealing. And then we need to prove that that has been done correctly. And that's how we use, where we use zero-knowledge proofs. We um, have a challenge response protocol baked into, into that uh, system. Um, using zero-knowledge proofs to prove that the encoding has been done correctly. That's like the main use, and it's very special purpose. Uh, what I'm really excited about is using zero-knowledge proofs for um, running computation on top of uh, Filecoin. So, so imagine being able to, so there's a project called Lurk um, that uh, started also in Protocol Labs um, that is about doing any kind of computation, like just Turing complete computation on top of uh, SNARKs. And so imagine being able to do like an Amazon Lambda style um, system where you can just like send a tiny little JavaScript function and then run it in a container somewhere, but it's really running under zero knowledge. And that's running over data on Filecoin, right? So you can take this really expensive um, computation and do it um, outside of the chain and then prove that the results you got were correct, were computed correctly, and then put those, those outputs into the, into the network. So I think like zero knowledge is going to be awesome for scaling computation. And I think there's going to be a bunch of Zero knowledge powered decentralized compute L2s uh, coming out on Filecoin like next year and the year after. Uh, and so, so, if you're really into zero knowledge, like that's a super interesting opportunity for you and others. Um, I, I think like all, that's all greenfield. Most of the groups doing zero knowledge are just focused on just making transactions faster on L1s and, and like roll ups. Um, and that's like cool, that's really exciting, but it's not nearly as cool as being able to do arbitrary computation, right? Like, think of like a, a, a Twitter. Th thread and knowing that like when you retweeted that was like done correctly and doing powering all of that in zero knowledge. Yeah, it sounds exciting. Yeah, that's uh, also can you maybe like contextualize how you see FVM working with all these other blockchains yeah. that are in the space today? Yeah, so so one of the really important design considerations um, for FVM and this is like maybe I'm an outlier here but this is kind of like what I brought to to the project is that I think that FVM's greatest promise is as a hypervisor um, a very low level underlying VM that works with Wasm uh, to then integrate many other VM runtimes. So um, we don't have, like, there's lots of groups exploring new VM runtimes. Like, the AVM is amazing, first of all. Like, already there's a lot of really good tools there. And we're getting things like Agoric um, and, and many other um, new and exciting um, smart contract primitives and new VMs. But what we don't have is an easy way for protocols to kind of have a layer of abstraction between those, um, those systems and new systems uh, and have them all interrupt in the same chain. And so what I think is like the, the really, really amazing long-term promise of FEM as a, as a, as a systems, from a systems perspective, is bringing that hypervisor to enable any kind of smart contract on any kind of platform to interrupt with each other in the same chain. So that's like what I'm really excited about. That's maybe medium to long term. In the shorter term, what FEM is really going to just enable is just smart contracts on Filecoin um, using EVM and using um, Rust uh, and like the native, the, the native Rust runtime. Uh, so all of that is is um, is exciting. Uh, and also like Cron. So I'm a big fan of the Cron actor in in Filecoin. This is like just a very simple actor that runs at the very end of every block to just uh, run through some callbacks. And this is a very imp like simple um, systems design decision from like Unix um, and, and era. And it turns out that like if you do that, like blockchains become like way easier to program. They kind of have a hard gas model problem that you have to figure out. Like for example, cron is not gonna be, you can't register callbacks to cron at the beginning. Um, but once we solve that, that's gonna be super exciting. Like it, whole entire like startups will get like 
replaced by that one single actor or one, one set of chips. You're saying cron? Yeah, CR. Like, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So like Unix, I, Unix machines have like this program called cron that you um, give them, you like write when you want it to run. Like you tell it like, hey, run every minute or every second or every day or a specific date. And then you just register another program to run at that interval. And then it just will happen. And so we, that should happen. Like blockchains should be able to do that. Blockchains are a great clock. It's kind of silly that you don't have like time-oriented callbacks. Um, yeah, interesting. I thought you said Tron at first, and yeah. I was like, that is a very controversial take that we have just said here. <laughs> yeah. um, OK, we have another question here on, well, my left. Um, hello, I'm Stephanie from uh, Hong Kong. We are from uh, Chain On Technology uh, Hong from Hong Kong companies. We have been uh, mining Falcons from day one. It's been a really hard time for this few months because Falcon has dropped a lot. So, um, so it is five or six US dollars right now. Uh, we believe it is uh, undervalued. What is the normal price? Do you think it is? And. Um, do you, uh, do you have any expectations for the future price? And uh, do you have any recommendations for uh, miners? I'm so glad she asked, because I wanted to ask, but I wasn't <laughs> going to, obviously. Yeah, it's been a really hard time uh, for miners, right? Yeah, so um, as probably all of you know, like, I uh, can't and shouldn't talk about uh, any kind of thing about price. Um, uh, what I'll tell you is, um, the, at the end of the day, um, all of the crypto space is much more affected by the macro ecosystem problem than anything within crypto right now. So the bigger problem to solve is like getting macro like sorted out. And so when the macro system started falling, um, I hosted an AMA and I, and I went around talking to a lot of startups and, and source providers about how right like the macro environment was going to get really bad and it's probably gonna continue bad for like many months. And so what's really, really important is that you can weather this winter. Um, look back to the last winter in crypto or the one before that. Tons of like, um, projects that didn't plan well like, were wiped out and, and like, just failed. Um, now, the projects that like, planned well, cut their costs, and weathered the winter made an enormous amount of, uh, of, um, of returns in the long term, either by building new projects and launching them later. So think of Protocol Labs as, as one of those uh, projects. Like we, have lived through many winters, um, or like many many um, uh, miners in other networks. So like I remember Genesis mining in Ethereum, like mining through several, like through I think two winters and two boom cycles, and and um, they kind of like dealt with with the, the massive highs and lows of Ethereum. Ethereum went like up, I think um, m many orders of like I think one order of magnitude or two or something really quickly, and then dropped like 95 percent of value like within a few months. And Genesis Mining and many other participants were, were like live through all of that. So my best advice to you is like remember, crypto assets are like highly volatile because they're f like traded 24/7 in these like super liquid uh, environments, and because they're tiny compared to macro, right? Like one trade in macro, like um, someone somewhere, like you know, the, uh, an important re uh, regulator somewhere in the world changes one interest rate by like. A ba like 10 basis points or 20 basis points, and that ripples through. And because macro, the, the rest of the economy is so big compared to like crypto, that like wildly swings all of crypto, right? And so you have to being in this environment is very diff like is, is hard, and you have to weather those those storms and just be able to like lean into the into the into the summers and like really kind of weather the winters. Yeah, Thank that you. Was we a are still strong believers. Thanks. Yeah, nice way of putting that. If you can live through a crypto winter, you can live through anything. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. We have a conference, like crypto winter. Yeah, for sure. Um, OK, yeah. I think we have a question over here as well. Um, hello, my name is Ian Kwon, which is a T I'm working in a, as a reporter in a TVCC, which is a blockchain media in Korea. And I have two questions for you. And the first question is, um, can you tell us Falcon's current status of the retrieval market? And nowadays, the Falcon is really into kind of storing the data. They're kind of mainly focused on storing the data. So like, how can you develop in the future? Yeah, so um, uh, what do you mean by current status in the market? Like, that's a very, like, can you maybe narrow it down? Um, like retrieval markets. You oh, mean. the retrieval yeah, markets. Retrieval Got markets, it. yes. Um, yeah, so the retrieval markets um, working group is a group with many different projects that are all building different kinds of virtual markets. Um, and 
for those of you unfamiliar with retail markets, these are CDNs. So content delivery networks enable you to uh, deliver content really quickly to users. Think of like very low um, latency, so like sub-second delivery of like large images and 3D objects and video and so on, right? So Netflix and like all of the, all of the video that you watch is usually delivered through CDNs. So Retrieval Markets are Filecoin's version of a CDN, and there are many of these. There are many projects and many networks that are, that are, gonna, that are being built. Um, and all of them have like, already kind of like working prototypes that are, that are pretty good. Um, and so you should, there are a lot of demos um, from the Retrieval uh, Markets Working Group on YouTube. You should go check those out to see like, where they're at. Um, one, of the, one of the ones that, I, that, um, that, that I'm helping out and, and getting involved with is um, Falcon Saturn. Um, and Saturn is, is, I think, going to be launching its alpha sometime in Q4. Um, and that's uh, tuning the, th that's going to be like a, a regional network that's going to map uh, a several different regions in the world. And it's going to be able to pin content to a specific region and be able to deliver it sub-second um, from that environment. And when Saturn doesn't have something, it's going to then um, look, look it up from other service providers to be able to serve it quickly. So think of it as like, um, being able to plan what content is going to arrive somewhere and then how, uh, getting it to deliver quickly. And we were sort of ex expecting, um, you know, retail markets to be kind of on the order of like anywhere from like hundreds of thousands to tens of millions of people could run these. Um, probably at the beginning, it'll be like 10 to 100,000 or something like that. Um, and then over time, like that could potentially um, scale out. Uh, there's a lot of different kind of like sub problems in a CDN. So each of those is likely going to be a different type of virtual market provider. So um, Saturn lays these out in terms of like L0 in the user's computer, like a cache right in the user's computer. Um, L1, which is kind of like a gateway close to the user. Um, L2s, which are pinning content in a particular region. Or L3s, which are um, in with storage providers. And so potentially you can have like many layers of caching here. Um, so that you can like, get the content as close to the users as, you, as, you, uh, as makes sense. Um, think of the internet as a big grapevine with lots of different nodes and so on, and all branching out. And you want to have content flowing from the super connected, dense area of the internet, which is data centers, like really massive amounts of storage, lots of bandwidth, um, and get all of that to kind of trickle out to users. Uh, and th this can be like, really slow and expensive because the bandwidth links are very, very low. But if you can kind of like pre pre-place all of the content out by the users, then you can serve it really quickly. Right. So that's what the virtual markets um, are going to be for. And it's called Saturn because you can think of like different rings of, of service, like you know, L0s, L1s, L2s, L3s are different rings. Nice. Thank you so okay. much. Um, and just to sort of set expectations, we have three minutes. We could probably go a little bit over time, but just FYI. We are now entering the rapid fire <laughs> stage of this Great. AMA. Um, I believe there's a question over here. It's working. Hi, um, I'm Sitora uh, from South Korea Tenet Data Systems, a storage provider firm. And I'm quite honored to be able to ask a question uh, in person from Juan Bennett. And um, actually, I have two questions. Uh, first would be um, about the Filecoin um, the, as a coin itself, the token itself. And then Second one will be the Filecoin and Protocol Labs as a community. And everybody's here asking questions about, like, um, what is it, IT things or the words that I don't, I understand, but I, I just want to say, speak English, come on, people. Because I'm, like, uh, in the um, marketing or community manager, I work. That's my um, part of my job. But I've been in Protocol Labs or Filecoin uh, over a year now. So I know the things, but for when it comes to even the cryptocurrency and decentralization over 10 years, but still we have this challenge when it comes to adoption. So, and then, um, and then yeah, when so it comes to utility as well. So, and especially for Filecoin, uh, that's what I want to ask uh, when, when it comes to community. I don't see there is um, like a good community running around other than for storage providers. Uh, I mean, for let's say investors. So what I want to ask, do you guys have any uh, future plans to organize and then um, build up this community? 
Yeah, so um, uh, I'm going to maybe just respond to like, the last bit, bit about sure. meetups just because yeah. uh, the time is running very short. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of different meetups uh, around the world for different parts of the community. Uh, the SP meetups are, are the most common around the world because there's SPs everywhere. Um, there's a lot of developer-oriented meetups, for example, um, and once Retrieval providers arrive, probably um, there will be meetups for those too. Um, there's a lot of kind of like developer and hacker um, hackathons and so on, and all of those are like kind of meetups right. for, for those communities. Right. Thank you. I mean, right. yeah, that's true. Um, uh, there, that's what I like about Filecoin itself too. There is in-person meetings for storage providers and stuff. Um, as a cryptocurrency investor myself, um, how about the investors and... Uh, uh, sorry, I, um, we have to cut because uh, the time is running very short. Sure, uh, And yeah. we want other people to ask questions. Thank you very much. Yeah. I think there is a question over here on my right. Uh, hi, I'm Himaja. I'm founder of Deeds, a new age marketing enterprise. Uh, my question is more generic. So as we delve deeper into the world of Web3, how do you think it's going to transform the market, marketing space in specific, how enterprises reach out to their consumers in more in general? Any thoughts about that? So um, I didn't quite understand. How, how will marketing be transformed? Yeah, how the, yeah, the I mean, I think marketing is already being transformed in a lot of places. Like, uh, you can think of um, NFTs, for example, as a super interesting way of building communities and marketing to a community of users uh, and building a network with your users that has a, a like, direct kind of asset associated with it and membership. Think of it like, like a membership card. Think of like the membership cards that you get at restaurants or other places like that. And an NFT can kind of create that kind of club environment. Um, but it's much more open and permissionless, right? Anyone can be part of it and whatnot that wants to be. Uh, and so I think like it's already kind of changing marketing in those kinds of ways. Um, and it also, you know, a lot of like crypto incentivization will probably arrive. Uh, eventually, we'll have kind of like, um, oh no, like this is like what you don't necessarily want, but maybe it's better. Like, like there'll there will be some like ad-powered things that will com kind of compete with Google and, and Facebook and so on, and they'll be crypto-powered. Uh, maybe actually that might be an extremely valuable business if you can create a user-respecting ad network that is like way cheaper because you can like undercut Google and Facebook, um, but you preserve like important rights for users and you certainly don't allow like political manipulation, like that could be adopted worldwide. And so like maybe there's an amazing business there and remember that the ad business is like, you know, many tr trillions or whatever. So like, hey, go, go for that. Okay, Thank you brought you. up NFTs, so now I have to ask Great. like what, what NFT is your favorite NFT that you own? Um, Do you own a bunch of NFTs? Uh, I don't own a ton of NFTs. I don't okay. own some NFTs. I'm trying to remember. I think they're like really things that I wanted to be NFTs that aren't NFTs. Um, <laughs> oh, what are those? Uh, could be well, so too. like uh, one of the things that I'm like, most proud of is um, finding this like amazing artist called Melody Sheep and supporting uh, uh, his work uh, for many years. Uh, and so PL and, and I have supported um, uh, Melody Sheep's work. And some of, like, he made these amazing pieces of art called, like, the time lapse of the universe or the time lapse of the future, which is kind of like a projection of, like, all of physics, all, all of what physics tells us so far of, like, different eras of the universe. Uh, now, of course, it's like, we don't at all know how these really interact, so it's, like, a lot of speculation, but it's super fascinating to visualize that kind of uh, amazing imagery. And there's just this beautiful music that, uh, that he makes. And so, like, those, like, we supported, but we supported them before, like, NFTs were a thing. Um, and so if like, I could like, have one NFT in the world, it would be like that, like the timeless of the future or the timeless of the entire universe, which are like, you know, my favorite pieces of art. That's uh, amazing. Yeah, I would also like to have that NFT. <laughs> Tell them to make yeah, them. Let's bid. Um, yeah. Um, okay, anything, this, our time is up. We have been out of time for a little while. Is there anything that you sort of want to wrap up here? Um, yeah, well, uh, I just want to really thank everybody in the community. It's been an amazing uh, last two years of the, of the network um, uh, growing. Uh, we're going to celebrate like the second um, uh, anniversary of, of the Falco Network um, relatively soon. Um, and that's just really thank you to the whole community for, for being part of the network and, and playing many different kinds of roles, whether storage providers or um, ecosystem developers or um, startup builders or token holders or participants and just in the broader community. Thank you for being um, part of this. This is your network, so really make of it what you want and try to get it to bring you much better right. Like my, my hope for you is that you can use things like Filecoin and IPFS and the rest of crypto to get 
much better rights for yourself and your family and your, and your children uh, for the future to try and get a much better, better um, digital infrastructure. And I would also like to thank the Filecoin Foundation and IPFS for us for like just an amazing event. Like it's just, thank you so much. I know that how much work it went to put this together. So thank you so much for, for building just such an amazing, uh, amazing event. Amazing, thank you so much, Juan. Thank you everybody for asking great questions. And we'll see you later.